Oh, good morning, everyone. How great he is. Did you hear that song we were playing right before we started? So good to be with you. We're here to just brag on God today, to talk about the things that he does in people's lives. And I'm so glad you're here. Um, so you're already seated. and Let's go ahead and prepare our hearts for worship. Please join me in the call to worship. Like clay in the hands of, a pot, of the potter, we are, we are shaped, shaped by, by your, your love and grace. grace. What are you making of our broken lives? You are, you are making, making us into, into a, a masterpiece. masterpiece, created to do good works. Once, Once we, we were far away, away but now, now we are near. near. We praise, we praise you, you the, the maker of our masterpiece, our masterpiece story. story. Wow. You are making us into a masterpiece. That's what we're talking about today. And everything that we do, and we think of it as a church, is really designed uh, by God to, to continue this work in us, both in us and in the people that we reach by the ministries that we do here at church. So I want to talk about a couple things I'm excited about. First of all, how do you like these journals that uh, our ministry team made available to you? These are for you to take and bring into worship and take home with you. And because you're taking them and making them on your own, okay with you in the sanctuary. But they kind of thought that maybe from time to time you might want to write down some notes, thoughts as we're going through our service today. So please feel free to take one if you don't have one yet on your way home some notes. Also, as you go out today, there is a flyer that's already wrapped in plastic and um, that's for your protection, but it talks about uh, an exciting conference that I'm going to be a part of that I wanted you to know about 
coming up on October 1st and 2nd. It's all online, but I am going to be facilitating a workshop with our own Judge Heather Russell, and I'm going to be asking her questions about the Amazing Change Court and how our church is helping to support the work that she is doing uh, in the Change Court with the women who are graduating. There will also be about four other judges from all over Ohio that have similar programs like the Change Court, and so I get a chance to talk to them also about what they're doing. So if you would like to register all the information here, um, you can register, and there are probably about 25, maybe 30 different breakout sessions that you can watch that all talk about building bridges with our community. So because it's coming up fairly soon, I wanted you to have that information, and like I said, you can take that home with you. So if you're joining us in person or online for the first time, uh, we are we're so glad that you're with us, and we want to know who you are. Uh, if you're here and we don't have your information, your email, uh, we would love to have that. So you can send that to Pastor Carrie at, no, it's pastor at cheviotumc.com, which will automatically get to my email. And we'll be able to connect with you and get you hooked up so that you can receive all the emails and find out what's going on at our church. So this is the way in this day and age that we need to connect with people, and we hope you take advantage of that. Next Sunday, we're having our new member Sunday. Very excited about that. We have three people that are joining our church next Sunday. And also, if you are interested in joining, and maybe you've been attending for a while but have never officially joined the church, this would be the Sunday to do it. And there uh, is going to be a one-hour new member orientation fun Get to know you class online on Saturday the 19th um, from 10 to 11. And that at 11, we invite everybody, well, from 10 to 12, we've got the food drive going on. But our folks that are coming to the orientation will be let out at 11 so that you can participate in the food drive. So uh, again, that is online. And we will be sending out links to everybody who is going to participate in that. So if you want to be part of it, you need to let us know so we can get a link out to you. Then coming up um, every Wednesday, well, of course, it's going on. I thought we were at a different side, but ongoing through the month of September, our church is participating in a food drive where we're handing out food for our community at the Cheviot School. And this particular, la I think there was a number, was there a number of meals that we handed out? Over 1,200? Oh, 1,250. 1,250 meals right up there at the top were distributed on September 9th. So this is a much needed ministry in our community. We're going to continue to do that through the month of September. So thank you to all of you who have participated in the food drive. Coming up next Sunday at 4 o'clock is our next prayer walk. You remember you saw a video of the people who participated last time and how much fun we had and the people that we met as we walked the community. We're going to do it again, uh, 4 o'clock, and that way we will come back to church when we're finished, and we will have pizza here and just fellowship, socially distance. It might be in the parking lot. It might be in the courtyard. We're going to go wherever we can go. Um, but we, it, it, even if you can't go, go on the walk with us, we invite you to come to the pizza party. Is that, is that fair to say? Because we love as many people as possible next Saturday, or next Sunday at 4 o'clock. And then our daily bread um, angels, I'm going to call them, continue to grow the number of people that are coming to make sandwiches for our daily bread. The next one will be Thursday, September 24th from 9.30 to 11. And you can contact Barb. And Barb, you want to put your hand up so people know who you are? There's Barb Scheibling. You can let her know that you're interested in helping out. You guys have a lot of fun, I have a feeling, when you're making those sandwiches. Um, so it's as much a fun thing as it is a really wonderful and needed um, ministry in our community. All right. Well, I think that's all um, of our announcements, but that's a lot, isn't it, uh, for this time? Um, you are watching online, and you ha oh, I have to grab something here. If you're watching online and you have some kids close by, um, I hope that they can uh, sit close to the computer for children's time. And because um, I want to talk to them, I want to talk to you guys about 
about what God is making of us. You know, um, while the kids have been at home and kind of stuck at home, how many, how many of kids or grandkids have been doing some crafts or some art projects at home? Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, when you finished, when you were a kid and you finished your art project, whether it was a cr crayon drawing or a water painting or watercolor, um, how many of you put your stuff up on the fridge? Yeah, we used to stick our, our, our creations up on the fridge. And um, people could walk by and they could see your artwork. And what our scripture is telling us today is that you and I and all the kids that are watching today, it's like God has stuck us up on the fridge because we are his artwork. We are his, the Bible says, his masterpiece. And he is creating in us all the time, making us into exactly the beautiful art that he wants us to be. It's a process, isn't it? So we are not quite finished yet. And the Bible says he's going to keep working on us until we're finished. But you know, our kids, our grandkids, nieces and nephews, our neighbor kids, all kids today need to know that they are God's masterpiece in the making. His work of art. And through us, the world gets to see what God is like. That's how they know who God is, is by looking at his creation. And that's you and me. So we want to thank God for the masterpiece he's making of us and, and to remember when we're not feeling all that great that we are in process each and every day of being made beautiful. Let's pray. Gracious God, for your word that tells us who we are, that you are displaying who you are through our lives. Let us yield to the master's hand so that each and every day there is more and more beauty shown through our life because of you. Make out of us a beautiful masterpiece. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.
that are happening on the West Coast, and I've got some family out there in Seattle. My niece lives there. I know Greg has a sister. Uh, maybe you have family members there, um, but we need to pray army of angels to come to that area and to, um, to just help in any way possible. family, uh, Dick and Carol, and all that are surrounding them, help them through this time of continued healing, hopefully for Carol, for all the changes that are going on in their family, um, lifting them up with that. We're also wonderfully grateful to get good news about Sharon Ackerman, who the doctor has uh, announced cancer-free. Uh, Sharon is cancer-free. <laughs> And she's still dealing with some after effects of the treatment that is for her. So we want to continue to pray for Sharon. And we're so grateful for the friends she has from this church that, are, that have been surrounding her um, during this time. We're lifting up also Diane Ringshauser, who had a, a bout of um, some kind of seizure, right, Bill? And we're not sure what it is at this point. But the good news is it's not an aneurysm. She's had that before. And... They've ruled that out, so they're continuing to test on Diane. Um, for those of you that don't know Bill, Bill is somebody that's going to be joining us next Sunday, so you can give a wave to Bill. He's over there in the... That's Bill. <laughs> so we're lifting up Diane. I also want to lift up the, our church during this time. This is a very busy time and a very exciting time for, because we're, we're preparing for next year. We're talking about... Where are we headed next year? What are the goals that we're setting as a church next year? There are people and teams meeting this week to set those goals. Um, so in your daily time, in your daily prayer time, um, can you take a moment, as you probably do already, and just for this time of planning and visioning and um, that, that God would bring the leaders that we need to put in places to move us into um, next year and beyond. Um, we're also continuing to pray for all those affected by COVID. 
um, and all of the changes in our lives because of this pandemic that continues without um, an end in sight right now for those in this church, also in our community that are struggling. What are some other people or situations that we would like to lift up to the Lord this morning? Is there anything you'd like us to pray for this morning? Yes. Julie Cook. Anyone else? Kathy? Charles, Charles Cummings Jr. The loss of one of our Change Court graduates this week and the, the ripple effect that can have out all of the graduates. We pray for them for strength and in their journey. Let's go to the Lord, I'm mindful this morning of your servant David who wrote in Psalm 46, when everything seemed to be falling apart around him, he reminded himself, as we remind ourselves this morning, that you are our refuge and our strength. He said that if the mountains would quake and fall into the sea, if the very foundations of the earth would crumble away, you still are our foundation. What an important truth that we stand on this morning as we face so much uncertainty, so much vulnerability, so much feeling as if our world is out of control. But we know that you are in control, Lord. And that when we draw closer to you and trust in you and believe in you, even though the world is in chaos, we are grounded. We are supported and protected. You are our refuge and our strength. And Lord, you also challenge us to be hands and feet wherever we can, in whatever ways we can, to bring hope and healing and just a word of encouragement whatever it takes for those who are struggling around us. And so to see the world with your eyes, help our hearts to ache for what breaks yours and empower us to be your hands and feet where you've called us to go. Lord, for all of these situations that we've lifted up and the people that we have lifted up this morning, we thank you in advance that you have heard this prayer and that in your time and in your way, you will answer. And now, called to pray the, the prayer that you taught us to pray, we pray together, our Father, Father who, who art in, in heaven, heaven, hallowed, hallowed be, be thy name, thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and, and forgive us our trespasses, trespasses as we forgive, forgive those who trespass, trespass against us. us. And lead us, us not, not into temptation, temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As part of our offering time today, many of you know I'll be uh, chatting with Greg Goodwin in a little while. And uh, Greg has written an original song called Masterpiece in the Making. And we'd love you just to um, sit back and enjoy the song and also to hopefully be blessed by the lyrics. This song came out of a time when I was in a church where there just seemed to be a lot of, you know, strife. And um, so I wrote this song just to let 
everybody know that we're all a work in progress, that um, we shouldn't be judging one another for, for where we're at because we're all, you know, in his hands and he, he's working on all of us. When I look at you, my brother, I can't complain or criticize or look down on you. Correct me if I do. Because the master still has his paintbrush in his hand And he's not quite finished, me or you So if I judge, then please forgive me For I've no right to think I'm better For what I am, or what I do but if you place your life like a canvas Before the master and his brush Then he'll paint a beautiful masterpiece in you Yes, you're a masterpiece in the making A work of art in God's hands And if at times it seems that he's taking a little longer than you planned. Be patient with me, and I'll be patient with you. And we'll let the master do what he must do. And then we'll appreciate in each other. Every brush stroke and every color Till the masterpiece is through Strokes of the brush may seem a little rough Maybe too much here Or a clash here or there And in other places there just isn't enough But you're a masterpiece in God's making and the finishing touches he has yet to do And if the canvas of your heart Stays still before the Lord Then we know he'll paint a masterpiece in you Yes, you're a masterpiece in the making a work of art in God's hands And if at times it seems That he's taking A little longer than you plan Then be patient with me And I'll be patient with you We must let the master do what he must do and then we'll appreciate in each other Every brush stroke and every color Until the masterpiece is through So pray for me And I'll pray for you And we'll let the master do what he must do and then we appreciate in each other The master and his masterpiece Because his masterpiece is you Amen
maker of masterpieces. You bestow us with talents far more precious than jewels. Open our eyes to the possibilities you hold for us and for our world. Transform the gifts we bring into light and love for all people. Ooh, I'm back on. <laughs> Our scripture reading. <laughs> Thank you. This morning is from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 18, verses 2 through 3. Go down to the potter's house, and there I will give you my message. So I went down to the potter's house, and I saw him working at the wheel. But the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands, so the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as seemed best to him. The word of the Lord, come to me. He said, can I not do with you, Israel, as this potter does, declared the Lord? Like clay in the hands of the potter, so are you in my hand, Israel. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Well, good morning, everyone. And um, I'm just happy to have Greg here with me today. And uh, we've, we've been talking a lot about doing this and talking with you and having a conversation. And I think what we most want, what we most want today is to kind of see, we, get, we want to brag on God. We, we want to show you some of the things that God can do through a life that uh, really is kind of um, surrendered to him. And we'll hear that through Greg's story today. But before I talk to Greg, I wanted to just kind of update you. Yesterday, we actually had our annual conference, which, as you know, normally happens in June. But because of COVID, we did not go to Lakeside this year, and so everything was online. And so I sat in my office yesterday from about 9 until about 1.30, and we celebrated our annual conference online. And if any of you have ever heard Bishop Palmer preach, you know what a powerful preacher he is. I wanted to share a couple of thoughts from his sermon yesterday, and we'll, we'll be able to help you, to allow you to see this. Um, but, you know, in the, in the face of all that's going on in the church today and in the world today, all the changes that are upon us, whether it be our denomination that is probably and possibly dividing um, next year as we face general conference and just the decline, the general decline in churches today, um, Bishop Palmer said this, he said, you know, in West Ohio, there are generally about a thousand churches that make up West Ohio. And he said, after all of this is said and done, all the changes that are brought about by the situations we find ourselves in, he said, I anticipate that we will have about 750 vibrant, alive, missional churches still left when all is said and done. And rather than trying to keep all a thousand of them going, and rather than being grieving, although we always grieve when a church closes, what would it look like if we planned for our church to be one of those vibrant, alive, missional churches? He called them missional outposts that are affecting the community around them. Because that seems to be the the, the guiding characteristic of churches that are thriving and growing are churches that are mindful of the community around them. I used to say when we were at the gathering that if the community around the church is not doing well, it's hard to say that the church is doing well. If the community around the church is doing well, the church is doing what it's called to do. And so that inspired me, and it made me think about... Um, what would it take for us to actually be able to impact the people in our community around us? And one of the uh, answers to that is the reason we're doing this six-week series. 
because I believe that in order to be that kind of transformative power and presence in our community, we have to understand who Christ is and who we are in Christ, what we've been called to do. We're already learning that in this church. You've already been doing amazing things in this church. Um, and so I just want to thank you for what you've been doing. Um, but I want you to get a picture of what Jesus can do in an individual's life. Because I think from time to time, I don't know, Greg, you, you may have experienced this when you were at the gathering and we saw people who, you know, sometimes were, just didn't seem like they were going anywhere. Um, do you have a microphone? <laughs> Um, but we, we can get a little bit cynical, we can get a little bit doubtful about, you know, does Jesus really still change lives today? And, and is it really possible to expect a changed life? Um, you know, in, on our wall, if you walk into Warner Lounge, on our wall is a picture of our church and a, a vision statement underneath that church, uh, underneath that picture. And it says that we are going to connect and serve all people so that lives are transformed and empowered by the love of Christ. That, that's really a big vision. But you know, I say, well, it's on the wall, so it must be true, right? It's, it's on our website, so it must be true. What would it take for us to live into that vision as a church? I've often said if, if just one church would actually be able to do the things that they claim they are doing on their website, <laughs> our communities would be vastly different, wouldn't they? And, but I think we can. I think it's possible for us. So, you know, we're approaching our third year together. I started in January of 2018. And church growth experts will tell you that year three is the year of movement. It's the year when things begin to really cook in a congregation uh, after a new, church, a new pastor has come. It's when we have established ourselves, we, we've got our leadership in place, we are poised to live into the vision that we have created for ourselves. And so because we've said that we're here to transform lives. We're here to transform lives. I want you to hear a story of how uh, God has been doing that in your life. So would you give Greg some love and just welcome him and thank him. <laughs> so Greg, um, you know, I, I tell us a little bit about, you know, you're growing up and yeah, I guess you're from Oregon, right? Yeah, I'm from Oregon. I was born and raised there. I had a good family. My dad was a dentist, so we had a good upbringing, lots of material things, vacations, snow skiing, and, and I played a lot of sports, soccer, and um, drumming. What else? You, were, you, you, you played soccer. You weren't just playing soccer. You were actually was, a really good soccer player. Yeah, I, I was pretty good. Yeah, you were, you were moving on to that next level. Of yeah, life. and then I had an injury that kind of sidelined me for a while, but so I know that you, you've told me that your, um, your mom passed away kind of tragically. My mom died when I was 21. Uh, I was playing in a rock band and um, she drowned scuba diving. And it was a very tragic death and took it real hard. Um, kind of tore the family apart a little bit, but um, with some circumstances regarding the aftermath of it. But um, I was deep into drinking and drugs and playing in a rock band, like I said, so that kind of went along with that lifestyle. And um, then two weeks after my mom died, the band I was in broke up, so it was like a double double low in my life. But um, then I just kind of floated around for a while, and the girl that I ended up marrying, we had a kid together. Her name's Melissa. She's 38 now and has three kids. So. Um, Something good came out of all that. Absolutely. <laughs> and she's in the ministry. So. It just kind of sounded like it kind of sent you into a, a time of just, just drifting. Yeah. Um, I got divorced in like 85, and then in 86, 
um, is when I gave my life to the Lord, but it went really good, was on fire for God for a while, and, and I was witnessing people, leading people to the Lord. I mean, I was just like on fire, and then I had some circumstances, where, and then I went back to some drinking and drugging, and it wasn't this wasn't the same. It was just that struggle to, to get back to where I know I needed to be. And it just seemed like an overwhelming thing to, to get back. And sometimes that's once you lose something like that, um, it can be hard to get it back. But you have to fight for it. Um, yeah. So um, you, you were in rehab, I know. You, you had come out of a rehab facility. Yeah. And tell us a little bit about that how you ended up from, you were in Oklahoma, right? Mm -hmm. Tell us about that experience yeah. of coming to Ohio. Well, um, for years I would, you know, I continued with the, the partying and that and um, homelessness, a lot of homelessness, stayed in a lot of homeless shelters, uh, rescue missions, and it was kind of a lifestyle you can really get stuck in because you can become complacent and everything's like given to you and, um, and you have to reach a point where you're tired of that and you know you want to go out and be independent but that went on for years and then uh, I went through treatment for like the fifth time it was a 30-day treatment and my first week my counselor said I want you to come up with a discharge plan it's like I just got here you know I'm getting the cobwebs out and and he, I said, okay, so I, I didn't want to go back to Oregon, or my sisters thought it wouldn't be a good, good idea for me to go back to my old stomping grounds. And um, so I thought, well, my brother lives in Ohio. He lived in Miamisburg at the time. He moved to Beaver Creek. But, so I called around Dayton and Cincinnati, and I found out a place, about this place called the Hope House in Middletown. And they said, yes, we take people. You got to be here between one and four. We can't reserve you a bed. If we have a bad opening, then you can get in. You have to pass the background check and all that. Make sure you don't have warrants. And, and so um, I told my brother if he could pick me up, asked him if he could pick me up at the Dayton um, Greyhound bus station. So I'm just praying, you know, I did my time and <laughs> I did my time. I spent my 30 days in treatment and I got out. And oh, my dad had died just right at the same time that uh, I was going into treatment. So I kind of thought of that as a milestone. You know, my mom died. I thought this would be a good time to get it together. But um, so I get taken to the bus station in the town where my treatment center was, Dodge City, Kansas. I was moved from Oklahoma to Kansas. And um, it, it was on Wyatt Earp Boulevard. <laughs> Everything in that town is like, you got Doc Holliday this and Boot Hill this and <laughs> Um, so, pulling out of that bus station, um, Carrie wanted me to tell her this, tell this story, so I'm just praying, God, I hope I'm doing the right thing. I already had the bus ticket to go to Dayton, and the bus is pulling out, and it's take, taking a turn, and it's like, I look out, and there's a big sign, Dayton Tires, you know, the tire company, and they got kind of like a sign that shape and just it just like jumped out right at the same time I was going God I pray that I'm doing the right thing here and it, it was did a light. It have arrow with flashing lights yeah, on it? No but it didn't need that it was just <laughs> um, so it was so I um, came to Middletown um, got into the Hope House they had an opening um, got there on like a Tuesday or a th Wednesday and the very next night they had a, a recovery group at the gathering, um, Pastor had started that church, um, and there was a group, I really liked it, the guy that was leading the group was a really nice guy, it was like a 12-step Christian-based recovery program, and, and I started going to that, I went to the church that next Sunday, and I started going there, and then they had like a talent night thing, we had open mic, that was always a lot of fun, um, I went to that, and I got up and did uh, some of my original music and, and um, that let them know that I was a musician. Talked to the worship leader and said, I'm available if you need somebody. And he said, we usually like somebody to join the church first. You know, um, three months was the usual just to make sure you get to know a person. I think that's a good, good policy for a church to 
make sure a pertinent person is, is going to be faithful in the little things. Show up for church and show that you're serious about it. And then uh, the worship leader left, and there was left an opening, and the bass player, Paul, he became the interim worship leader, and he didn't want to do it. He was a Dayton, uh, Dayton, Christian, Dayton Christian, is that what it's called? School teacher, and he asked me if I wanted to come up and play, you know, so I was kind of in the back, and then we'd get a song that Bob, the old worship leader, used to sing and lead, and i go, I know that song, I'll, I'll give it a try, and pretty soon they, they ended up asking me to be the worship leader, and so here I was staying at a homeless shelter or a rescue mission, and I was already a worship leader of the church, and, and it was like almost exactly about three months um, that I had so I started going. So okay. For just a minute, um, because what is amazing to me is that Greg, you know, we talk about how God uh, uses us and is making a masterpiece out of us, and that. The, the life that he is forming in us is going to be impacting other people. So at the time that Greg talks about coming to the gathering, we had moved into a storefront. Remember, we started in the basement of an ordinary United Methodist Church, not unlike this one. Um, we were there about a year. We moved out, moved into a storefront that was right between the men's Hope House homeless shelter and the women's homeless shelter. So all the, pe all the traffic would go right past our front door. That was really important because we were within walking distance of the people we were trying to reach. But what's amazing to me is that within a few months, Greg is now um, coming out of this, this really, really tough time in his life, and he is now w leading worship for a uh, congregation that is primarily men with addiction issues, right? Many men who had, had uh, done time in prison um, many people with mental health issues, and he's now uh, ministering to them. And I uh, see that's God's economy. That's how God works it out. And uh, so I'll let you keep going with the story. So I get what? Do you have more? So long and winding road. What happened? Oh, <laughs> long and winding road of God's sovereignty and providence. So it's like he's. It may seem like chaos. There's a song called Whatever You're Doing, and it, the chorus is Whatever You're Doing Inside of Me. It seems like chaos, but somehow there's peace. So, you know, God operates in a, God is never in a frantic, you know, panic of when he's doing his work. He's at peace with what he's doing. He knows what he's doing. And so it may seem like, God, am I on the right path? Am I going in the right place? And he may even use all those failures and all those mistakes to, to do that long and winding road to get getting a person to where they, they need to be. And that's kind of the way I see it. When I got here, it was Carrie called it a perfect fit. And, uh, you know, we would meet like on Tuesdays and we would plan and talk about the, the upcoming Sunday and what songs we're going to do. And we just always seemed to be on the same page. Pretty soon she was letting me uh, lead Bible studies. I started leading the small men's groups. Um, the recovery groups, and so it was um, staying, you know, neck deep in, you know, um, in ministry, and that's really what helped me, you know, in my recovery. I ha I'll have nine years clean and sober on October 5th, so, and there's a scripture, 1 Corinthians 15, 58, it's one of my favorites, it's, it says, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for we know that your labor is not in vain. So staying steadfast, just deep in the Word, deep in the Word, deep in the ministry, and that will help you stay, you know, on the path. Um, so, you know, uh, we talked about this a minute ago, but the people that we're going to see, Greg today, Roger Bush next week, um, they are kind of the exception sometimes. You, you guys are maybe in the one to... 5% of people who actually are able to move out of this lifestyle that you can really get stuck in, whether mm -hmm. it's homelessness or just, just being stuck. And you told me some things that made a difference for you that you did that you didn't see a lot of other people doing that, that helped you move forward. What were some of the things that you did? Well, I've seen it time and time again. People go into like a rehab they get out, and they go into the same, they're right back in the same environment. And you've got to have a plan. 
sometimes that plan has to involve just cutting off all ties with, you know, with with your love, you know, people that you hang out. They say you got to change your, you know, people, you know, everything you do has got to change. And there's the thing that they call the geographical cure, which they say doesn't always work. And that's where a person thinks, well, if I move to another town, then I'll be away from all that and, and I can stay clean and sober. But there's a saying, wherever you go, there you are. So it's, it's where you're at in your head and in that that's, you know, it's real easy to go find a liquor store. If, you know, if you want a drink, you're going to go, you'll find it. And... Um, I saw other people getting oh. out of homelessness and, and getting Yeah, um, I feel like a rare, fortunate person because not that many, the percentage of people that actually go into treatment and get out and stay clean and sober. Because I'd been through like five times and, and I've seen people, you know, revolving door in and out and, and I feel so fortunate because um, I've been able to stay clean and sober this time. And I had a, you know, I kept with the plan. When I came out here, I got in that Hope House. It was a structured environment. I got plugged into a local church and got involved in the ministry. And um, I've stayed at a, um, you know, like I said, I've stayed in rescue missions. And I see guys still there, you know, after years and years. And I've seen people, you know, like I said, going back to the same environment. But I've seen guys get back on their feet, and it's rare. You see somebody that's been really messed up, and they get it together. And I say, I want that, you know. But it seemed, and I think this is true for a lot of people that were in my condition, it just seemed like a, the road is too long, too rough, the mountain is too high to climb. But it's, it's, you know, like they say in AA, one step at a time, easy does it. You have to take it one step at a time. It's not going to happen overnight. Your loved ones, people you've, you know, you've got to earn back their trust in you. So a lot of people, they get clean and sober, and they just think everything's going to be fine with all their loved ones who you've disappointed over and over again. But you've got to prove to them, you know, because it's time to, oh, yeah, it's going to work this time. Yeah, I'm going to be... You know, they get out of treatment, they make all these promises, and they go right back into it. So, um, with my sister, my sisters, you know, I get one year, they go, good job, they get two years, good job, you know, and I got up to five years, it's like, I think he's serious this time, you know, type of thing. And, you know, I think opportunity for ministry, I'm always looking for that, but Greg said that when he was in the shelter, there were supposedly caseworkers and counselors, people that came yeah. that were supposed to help you but they really weren't all that helpful? Yeah, I've seen it, especially at the Hope House. Um, each one, each guy gets assigned a counselor, a caseworker, and that caseworker is supposed to sit down with you and say, okay, where are we at? You know, you, we need to get your birth certificate, your ID, whatever you need, social security card, and that way you can go to these agencies, and this is what they should do. They should be required, these caseworkers, to sit with you at least once a week to, to you know, get your ducks in a row and, and say, okay, here's, here's what you qualify for this program for housing or this program for finding um, help with a job, this program if you've got mental health issues. And that's, I, most of the programs I heard about was from word of mouth, from other people, from guys that were staying there. My caseworker, he didn't do squat. And um, that kind of bothered me. And um, so, like you know. Said when we were talking, yeah. hey, that could be an idea for a ministry, right? Yeah. I th one, of, one of the ways the church maybe can come around and, and provide some of those. There things. are ministries, but I don't know if those people know where a person is coming from because you could, a lot of guys at the Hope House in Middletown, they just felt like they were in limbo. They were just going nowhere. They were here at this homeless shelter. They got all these circumstances. They're coming out of drugs and alcohol, broken relationships. The wife kicked them out or whatever. And, you know, they just don't have any direction. So, um, you know, if I were to run a place like that, I would require my caseworkers to sit down with their, their clients and to 
do just stay on top of them and just saying, hey. And what I tell guys is just ask, seek, and knock. There's so many programs, and just keep asking God, you know, and keep seeking and keep knocking. And that's what I did, and God started opening doors. It took a while, but I think that was God's design for it to take a while. I had to be patient. So I'm going to I'm going to bring us full circle just with the time today. But okay. if we fast forward to um, how Greg got here, uh, I had left the gathering in in 2000 whatever it was 18, mm -hmm. and um, you know there was some issues with the gathering and stuff like that. And so Greg kind of you kind of weren't involved in anything for a while. You were not doing any music, no worship leading. You were just kind of hanging out in Middletown and. And Miles, if you remember, Miles and Adam um, came and, and did uh, worship in the contemporary service for the summer. Greg and Miles and Adam had, been pl had played together in, in their band. So they were good friends. And Miles came to me and said, Mom, Greg's not doing anything. He's just kind of hanging out. He goes, you know, what, what, it's not good for him to just not do anything. And, and you came and played with those guys one Sunday here at Chevy. Mm -hmm. And I think, was it a year ago? I don't know. I can't remember now. But... But uh, we started, God started just putting this idea in our mind that maybe Greg could actually move here. Um, and he came up one Sunday and said, you know, I feel like I'm ready for a move. I'm, I'm, I feel mm -hmm. like I'm ready to get out of Middletown and um, move, move to Cincinnati. And so we just started praying about that. And at that time, I was giving you rides back and forth, and we had long conversations in the car. It was when Miles went back to college. Yeah. And um, so that left that opening, and that's Another when Miles opening. was nudging you. and. And you said that you were out walking or something, and God just kept putting you on your heart. I would wake and, up in the morning, and Greg Goodwin would be, not, not like I'm dreaming about you, but like God would put Greg Goodwin on my mind, you know. And, I, and I'm like, God, it's not possible. How are we ever going to get him down there? How would we ever do this? It's not possible. And you were going, it's going to take more time out of my morning to go pick him up. And <laughs> that was the other thing is that, that uh, and yeah, thank you for So I didn't have transportation, so I was relying on her to get back and forth and just make a long story short is um, the pandemic came along and it was the end of March and I thought, well, when am I going to put my, th my notice in to move out of my apartment in Middletown? Kind of got pushed back and then it was like push comes to shove because they, you know, I wanted to get housing. I qualify for, you know, low income housing. but. They let me stay at the Parsonage, and I thank all of you for that. So I stayed there. The pandemic hit, so I was just kind of staying there and watching over the church, and it wasn't far to go to work. And we started doing the videos because we couldn't have in-person in services. And um, what else was so, I going to say? Here's, so oh, I wanna, we're going to yeah. wrap up. Like two more minutes. Yeah, two I have minutes. a scripture I wanted to read. Yeah, but, go ahead. Um, I wasn't checking my messages or anything. <laughs> I kept looking at my phone, make sure I got the scripture lined up. This is Romans 8, one of my favorite passages, 18, starting with 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, because the creation itself also we be delivered from bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. And for me, that meant that God allows people to just hit rock bottom. And it may be, you know, his design. Why have you allowed this to happen? There's another scripture that says, why have you created me thus? And um, then it goes on to say, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings, which cannot be uttered. And it goes on to say, everybody knows the Scripture, Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. I knew I was called. For whom he foreknow, he predestined to be conformed in the image of his Son. And, um, I know we're, we're right on the time schedule, so thank you so much for everything you've done for me. This church has just brought me out of a, you know, it's just part of God's plan. I just know it is. So, And I thank God for Pastor Carrie. She's really been a great pastor to me, a mentor, a friend, and um, 
I thank you all for being my friends too. Thank you so much. We're going to pray for you before we leave today. So if you want to just extend an arm out and uh, bless Greg, um, we're going to send him off with our prayers. Gracious God, we are so grateful for this man you've brought to us, for the work you've done in his life, for the miracles that have just keep unfolding, and for the, for the witness that he is for who you are. We pray that you would continue to bless him, strengthen him, encourage him in his recovery, grow him in his faith, uh, help him to, uh, to thrive in this new job, both as our worship leader and also as uh, hit with his job at Santorini, that in every way, Lord, you would bring abundant life into his life. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace now and until we meet again. Amen. Yeah. 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 Want to walk out with me?